You know, sometimes when, uh, um, sometimes when, when I, I sit down to pray and I say, God, what do you want me to talk about? Like, you know, there's, there's, you know, one of the beautiful things about scripture is that I can open this book up anytime to any place and there's so much to talk about. It, it never, it's, it's like we sing a song that talks about the well of God never runs dry. And that's how I feel when I open God's word. It's like you open this up and you begin to, to read through it. And it's, it's like a well that never, ever dries up. It continually satisfies your thirst. The challenge for me as a pastor, and Alan kind of alluded to it a little bit when we talk about discipleship. The challenge for me is trying to get you to come to God's word and to open it up and to discover the same well. Because it's one thing for me to tell you about it. It's one thing for me to talk about it. It's one thing for us to, this is why we have people like Alan every week come up and testify because it's easy for you guys to look at me and go, oh yeah, but you know, you're kind of a, you know, you got an odd little life that we could never relate to. You know, you guys know my story. I don't belong here, right? (laughs) It's but I don't want you to use that as an excuse. And that's why we bring up normal people that you can relate to, that can share what God's done in their life. Because you'll hear in these testimonies a consistent theme, which is God's word, God's word, God's word, God's word. My friends, we live in a time, I mean, all of us probably are, have seen what's going on this last week in the news, all over the headlines of, of, of the news and and. Uh, you know, Facebook. I mean, there's all kinds of things happening in our culture, in America right now that, that cause a person to um, not really know which way to go when it comes to their beliefs, when it comes to following after God. And now more than ever, we have to commit our hearts to God's word. We have to come to a place to where we begin to force ourselves to get past our fears of diving into God's word so that you can join the many, 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 many people that have gone before you that can say with their own lips, I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, that I have experienced the blessings of the Lord because I've learned to follow the ways of the Lord. You have to take this for yourself. You have to begin to learn how to read and how to understand. And, you know, I love what Alan said about discipleship because discipleship is a, two, it's a two-way thing. You know, you have to have a willing person who says, I'll open myself up to another soul and I'll share my experience, I'll share my life and my stories and the things that I've learned. But then it takes another party who's on the receiving end that says, but I'll be receiving what you have to share. I'll too open my heart up and say yes to what you have to offer. And when you have those two parties come together, well, now you have the perfect picture of the way that I believe that Jesus intended for his gospel to go out into the world. It's supposed to go from person to person. It's not supposed to go from preacher to a crowd. Don't get me wrong, God uses everything, but God wants for us to rub shoulders with each other. He wants for us to be involved in each other's lives. I wanna share with you guys a story tonight that We've talked about before, but it's a story that I know I can relate to, and I know that many of you can relate to, and it's found in the book of Luke, and the and the the story that I'm going to share with you starts in verse number one, Luke chapter 19, and verse number one. Follow along on the screen as I as I read this for you. It says Jesus entered Jericho, and he made his way through the town. And there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead, and he climbed up a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus walked by, he looked up at Zacchaeus, and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down, and he took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. 
He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and he said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded by saying, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man, Jesus, came to seek and save those who are lost. My, uh, my son, I've got a couple sons, three sons, but one of my sons is, is at that stage in life where he's graduated from high school and he's thinking about going to college. I'm trying to force him to go to college, but that's a whole other story. And he's in this interesting spot because in order for you to actually get from where he's at to where we want him to go, he's got to sit down and he's got to fill out some papers, and he's most likely going to have to take a test. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been in this situation before where you've had to sit down and you've had to take a test for something. And you sit down and you're just like, okay, they're going to ask me questions and they're going to ask me what I know and all these things. I know there's some brothers or sisters here who uh, spend some time in the military. Maybe you're still in the military. From what I understand, if you sit down with a recruiter, they give you a test. And based upon this test, they're going to they're gonna see where you're at in life. They're going to look at what you know and the experience and they're going to size you up and try to make you fit into a good spot based upon where you're at. My son's the same place. He needs to take a test so that they can kind of size up which classes he needs to take. They can kind of chart a course for him and say, okay, where do you want to end up? And this is the way that that we're going to go for you. You know, I find that many times when people come to God whether it be through the doors of a church or whether it be through a conversation with somebody that they know that, that is a believer in God and they're just like, wow, this, this journey of faith, you know, is something that I'm, I'm, I'm inquisitive about or I'm not sure about, but I want to check it out more. Many times they, they formulate this idea of how it's going to go. And they think many times that in order for me to get to where I want to go, I've got to take some kind of test and I've got to have the answers and I've got to know what I'm supposed to do. But I want to paint a different picture for you for a second. I want you to imagine for a second that at the beginning of your spiritual journey, you sit down with me. I'll be the guy that gives you the test. That would be a lot of fun. So I sit you down, and I say to you, this test that I'm about to give you, you cannot study for. You cannot prepare for it in any way. doesn't matter how much you know doesn't matter how many books you've read. It doesn't even matter how spiritual you think you are. I'm going to give you this test, and it's got, one an- it's got one question on this test. This is a good test, right? One question. And the test is placed in front of you, and here's the question. You ready for this? The question to this test is, are you willing to learn how to love? No, 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 you're not taking the test. I'm just kidding. Are you willing to learn how to love? I find that this question is one that many people find difficult to answer. Because it seems so simple. Oh, yeah, of course. You know, I know what love is. I know how to love. Love is a big word these days. A lot of people think they know how to categorize love. A lot of people think they know what love really is or what love isn't. But we've been talking about the fact that when we come to God, we don't have a clue what he's like. We've got these imaginary ideas, but we don't have a clue what he's really like. We read a few weeks ago in the book of Colossians, the verse that says that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. That Jesus is literally the picture that we can see that gives us some clarity and some distinction to be able to wrap our mind around what God is really like. Jesus came so that we could know God. And so as we come to this question, are you willing to learn how to love. The question 
comes back to this place that you put yourself in where you say, God, I'm willing to allow you to teach me everything that you know about love, which means I don't know how to love. I need to learn how to love. This story that we look at is very interesting when you look at it from a particular angle because at this point in Jesus' ministry and in his time, you know, he's done some stuff. He's got some, a little bit of notoriety going on and people know who he is. Matter of fact, at this particular time, the story that we just read says that crowds of people would gather around Jesus. So that meant that he was saying some things that people wanted to hear, or at least they were curious to hear. And in this particular story, it, 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 it singles out this guy named Zacchaeus, which is kind of a strange name. I like to call him Zach for short. So this, this guy, Zach, the Bible says, was a guy that he wasn't very tall. You know, nothing wrong with that. But it is an issue if you're in the back of a crowd and everybody else is taller than you. So this guy, <laughs> thank you. And so this guy, Zacchaeus, Zach for short, he was a smart guy. He may have been small in size, but he was, he was smart. And so he said, I know what I'll do. I will run ahead of the crowd And I'll get up ahead where everybody's heading. I can see the trajectory of this mob of people. And I'm going to climb up a low-lying tree, a sycamore fig tree. I'm going to get up in a place. I'm going to perch myself. And I am going to have literally front row seats for this event, baby. I'm going to be right there just able to see this. Pretty smart move. And so Zacchaeus runs ahead. He gets in the tree. And sure enough, the crowd starts to move past And as Jesus begins to move past this scene and he sees this guy in the tree... The most amazing thing happens, Jesus calls him by name. Now, the Bible doesn't say how Jesus knew his name, but the Bible very clearly says that Jesus spoke to him by name and says, I want to go and be a guest in your house. And this interaction takes place, and Jesus and Zacchaeus find themselves in this home. Some of you guys have heard this story before, and you know that this particular character was not well-liked in town. He was shunned from social circles. Nobody wanted to be this guy's friend because this was the guy that once a year, or however they did it, I'm not really sure, but in our culture, it's once a year, April 15th, by the way, you have to go see Zacchaeus. And he pulls out your name and he pulls out the tax books and he says, okay, Mr. Jason, let's see what you owe this year. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever been in the sales business before, but if you have, then you know this thing called commission. Well, Zacchaeus got commission off of everything he brought in, and so they knew that this guy was literally making his money off of taxing his own people. They did not like this guy at all. Matter of fact, they shunned him. And so Jesus, when he calls him by name, and he says, I want to go to your house, and I want to, I want to spend time with you, it's very interesting because... Zacchaeus comes down and he welcomes him into his house and through this interaction, something amazing happens in Zacchaeus' life. Something spiritual happens. He experiences God's love and he makes a U-turn in his life. The story isn't laid out in detail where you can see how exactly this all took place, but in our mind's eye, we can use our own stories to kind of fill in the blanks. How did it happen for some of you in this room where God encountered you with his grace and all of a sudden your life was looking this way, but as a result of this situation, now all of a sudden you're looking this way. Something like that happened in Zacchaeus, and all we know is that by the time that this interaction with Jesus was over, his heart was changing, and he was saying some crazy talk, and he was saying things like, Jesus, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. Some of us have a hard time giving 10 bucks to the little black box. This guy says, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. He says, if I've cheated anybody on their taxes, I will pay them back four times as much. You want to talk about amends? Wow, this guy's like, I'm going to go really, really, really far. Why was he so drastic in his approach? Something happened in his life that changed everything. 
So you've got this, you've got this experience going on between Jesus and Zacchaeus, you've got this experience going on where God is loving this man for the very first time. I love it that Jesus handpicks probably the worst guy in the crowd. And yet his response is transformation. That's the response. But there's something else that happens in this story. There are some other people. And this is the part that's really something to think about. It says that there was a crowd of people there that day that saw this go down. And it says that the people were displeased because Jesus was going to go to Zacchaeus' house. They said to themselves, Jesus has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. And they grumbled. They knew who Zacchaeus was. And they didn't like the fact that Jesus was spending time with him at all. Matter of fact, when Jesus went off to go do it, they got together in their little little circles. And they began to grumble to each other. You guys know what grumbling sounds like, right? Yeah. I don't need to go into details about what grumbling sounds like. But under the underlying surface, do you know what they were really saying? You know, we love this whole Jesus guy, and we love what he's saying and all the love that he's showing and stuff, as long as he's showing it to people that look like me. But I don't want that Zacchaeus guy getting saved. I don't want that guy getting any kind of grace. Do you know what that guy did to my family? Do you know what that guy's done to me financially? Do you know what that guy, that guy is the lowest of low. That guy is such a cheat, there is no room for that guy. That guy needs to be out of here. Now, we're okay, but that, no, there's no room for that guy. This attitude that begins to surface in this crowd of people, sadly to say, is alive and well all around us today. Alive and well. Sometimes it sounds different, sometimes it's masked a little bit, but it's alive and well, but at its core, it is the absolute opposite of what Jesus was trying to teach us and demonstrate in this situation. And that goes back to the test that you all sat down. Remember, are you willing to learn how to love Because Jesus said some radical things about love. Jesus did not say, love those that look like you. Love those that treat you right. Love those that that you believe really have a shot at changing. No, Jesus said some things like, love your enemies. Jesus talked about your enemy as being somebody that you're supposed to love. Anybody in here ever had an enemy in their life? I don't want to stir up any bad thoughts for you right now, but Jesus talked about love in a completely different way than you and I talk about it. He says, Jesus said the kind of things like, bless those that curse you. When somebody does you dirty, now that's my words, not Jesus, but he says when people spitefully use you, When people stick you in the back, Jesus does not say, walk away, they're unsafe. Jesus says the opposite. He says, love keeps on going forward. He says, love doesn't stop. Jesus talked about the kind of love that said, you you love when they tell you to F off, you love them some more. When they push back and say, I don't want you, you love some more. Jesus talked about the love that just doesn't stop. It's relentless because the kind of love that Jesus talks about is the kind of love that he's using to come after you and me. Jesus says, I'm going to love you with a relentless love that doesn't stop even when you back up and say, get away. My friends, are you willing See, this isn't stuff you get, this isn't normal, right? This is not normal stuff. You've got to be willing to let him teach you how this works. 
you got to be willing to say, okay, I am going to let you teach me how to love. This attitude, this grumbling attitude, it surfaces in us because the underlying root is really a word that the Bible calls self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. We read over and over and over again about the fact that within you and within me, in order for us to find salvation in Christ, we have to come to a place where we're willing to accept that there's nothing good in us. That the only thing that we have that is good is in God. That he bestows upon us his righteousness. That he bestows upon us the right to be called children of God, to be able to come to God and say, God, because I had nothing to offer you, you gave me everything, and now I can know you, and I can be a son and a daughter of God. Because of that, we are given his righteousness. We're made right. But within this crowd of people, this grumbling attitude begins to surface, and people begin to think, Not out loud, but in their hearts. There's a little bit of good in me now. I've got some self-righteousness. I've done some changing. I'm not who I used to be. I think I'm in a position now where, you know, I can probably size up that guy that's coming through the door, and that guy is no good. I could tell you straight up. He's no good. And all of a sudden, this this attitude begins to overtake us that begins to shape the way we see each other. And it is rooted in self-righteousness. And my friends, when a person begins to think of themselves as righteous because of anything that they have done or anything that they have achieved or anything that they have have ever accomplished or, or otherwise... We have these two forces that we talk about all the time, pride and humility. And all of a sudden that pride and that haughty spirit is beginning to manifest itself and it's not good. Jesus sees all of this that's going on. He sees what's happening and he hears what Zacchaeus has to say and this is his response. He says, salvation has come to this home today. Salvation has come to this home today. You guys remember that this is the worst guy in the crowd. Jesus picks the guy that everybody hates. This is the guy that nobody wants to be around. This is the guy that everybody else has discarded and said, no way, that guy is, he's not even a loyal countryman. He is not one of us anymore. This guy takes advantage of us. He's taken advantage of my family. There's nothing about that guy that I want to have anything to do with. And Jesus says, this is the guy that I want. He says, salvation has come to this home today. And then he says these famous words. Jesus says, he's talking about himself. Jesus says, for I have come to seek and save those who are lost. For Jesus came to seek and save those those who are lost. This is a big deal for us right now because whether you realize it or not, every single moment of every single day, God is bringing opportunities into our lives for us to demonstrate what Jesus demonstrated in this story. If we will see what God wants us to see. But don't make any mistake about it. There is also every single moment of every single day opportunities to see things from the the, the perspective of the crowd and to grumble and to point their finger and to size people up and say, this guy maybe, that guy never. Every moment these things are happening, we live in a world that is at war. Light and darkness, there is a constant battle going on. We see the news, we see the things that are happening in our culture right now, and we recognize that there is tension, and we recognize that there are people that are literally 
coming at each other and they are just tearing each other apart. There are lines being drawn. There are people saying, I'm on this side. There are people saying that I'm on this side. But I want you guys to remember something because what my heart is breaking over is that everybody is missing the whole point. Ephesians 6 says these words in verse number 10. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. What does it say next? It says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Every single day, whether you realize it or not, there is a presence at work in this world that is not of God. Jesus had a famous encounter with Satan. Satan takes Jesus up to the top of a mountain and he shows him the whole world. And we read in the, in the gospel that Satan says to Jesus, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give all of this to you. How could Satan offer to Jesus some kind of a temptation like that? It's because God, in his sovereign plan, temporarily gave Satan authority over this dark, fallen world. And when you forget that for even one second, everything that's happening around you will stop making sense. You will begin fighting against people. You will begin looking at each other like, well, this guy's the problem, and if this guy was dealt with, everything would be fine. That guy's not your problem. You will forget that the enemy has been coming up with a game plan to disrupt everything that God wants to do in this world. And guess what? He is doing a fabulous job. He is jacking with people left and right. And people are choosing to believe that my battle is against people and it is not. My battle is against something else. And God says, I want people who will begin to come into this dark world that we live in and to be able to see with eyes of the Spirit, clothe themselves with the clothing of God that he's given to every single person who calls himself a believer, to clothe themselves with the armor of God and to be able to walk into this dark world and to be able to see the difference that the crowd can't see that wants to grumble and wants to look at people and judge them and point them out and say, that's not right, that guy will never get it, that guy's doing it all wrong. And Jesus walks right into the same situation and sees the same guy and says, I want to have a meal with you. Why? Because the, the devil is all about destruction, but our Father is all about restoration. And when you begin to understand that, when you begin to understand that, and you don't take your eyes off the ball, you don't get distracted with all of the temporary things. This last week, the highest court of our land made a landmark ruling and I talk, about the, I talk about the Christmas globes sometimes in my life, right? You know those little globes where you shake it up and the, the stuff shakes everywhere? That's what happened, in, that's what happened in, in our country this last week. And you've got people that are celebrating and you've got people that are crying and you've got everybody in the middle. But my friends, our fight is not against flesh and blood. If you take your eyes off of the ball and you begin to take your eyes and focus on these temporary things, you begin to believe the lie that this world is actually your home. It's not your home. You begin to believe that, that, that there's things that are happening around you that are bigger than they actually are. You're in these moments of troubled times, and they are troubled. There's a lot of confused people that don't know what to do, and that's why I said that now more than ever, we have to go to God's word and say, God, I'm going to build my life on your word because it never changes. I'm going to continue to seek you, continue to read. I'm just going to continue to just allow you to speak to me because this world is becoming more and more unstable. But when you begin to fix your eyes on Jesus and not on the temporary things of this world, you begin to understand what's really going on. Jesus made some strong statements to you and to me. 
A few weeks ago, we were reading in the book of John. Let me refresh your memory what he said. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, If the world hates you, remember it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. Jesus says, I chose you. I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. We've talked many times about this idea of world. Do you realize that all through scripture when it talks about the world, it is not talking about people, it's talking about the rulers, the principality, it's talking about the spirit of darkness that infiltrates this world. Do you realize that when Peter came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I don't want you to go and die on the cross, that's a terrible idea. Do you realize that in that moment, the ruler of this dark world was working a plan through Peter and Peter was literally speaking for Satan. Do you realize that the devil speaks through people all the time? Now, I'm not talking, if you're married, that is not like, (laughs) that's not what I'm going with that. (laughs) Had to give you a little humor. It's getting a little too heavy in here. The point is, you can take your eyes off of the eternal and you can put them on the temporary that fast. And all of a sudden, your peace is nowhere to be found. All of a sudden, you have enemies that you cannot love. All of a sudden, you have self-righteousness that begins to rise up, excuse me, rise up inside of you. All of a sudden, things start to shift in your perspective of everything that God is doing in your life. I don't need to tell you guys again that have never heard the gospel of Jesus, but the gospel is not something that's an It's like this half and half type of a thing. Jesus says, if you want to be a follower of me, it literally means that you give up all of your rights. When you become a follower of Jesus, you have no more rights. Trip on that for a second because the word rights is a big deal in our land right now. If you identify as a follower of Christ, you have literally given up your rights to yourself. And you've said, I am going to allow God to be the Lord of my life. That means he calls the shots. He is boss. That means that I allow him to literally tell me what to do. Jesus says, you're going to pick up your cross every day, and you're going to follow after me. You're going to deny yourself. This is not comfortable. I hate denying myself. I don't know anybody that is just so happy to say, man, I really want to go do this, but I am going to deny myself because I know that God is telling me, hold up a minute. But Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you're going to learn how to deny yourself. Our culture says, don't deny yourself anything. If this is what you need to be happy, then by all means do it because you don't need to deny yourself. Well, I'm sorry, but Jesus said the complete opposite. He says there's going to be things that you're not going to get to do. You don't get to do these things if you follow me. You have to deny yourself. You have to begin to understand that the moment that you said yes to Christ, he puts you on this path that is extremely narrow. It's a, it's a narrow path. It's hard to find. It's a path that very few people actually find the footing to be able to get on. And yet this is the gospel. And the last thing that I want to say, because when I read this story of Zacchaeus, it's, it's, a, it's a great reminder for me and for many of us about the power of the Holy Spirit. Because... I don't know about you guys. Actually, I do know about you guys. You guys have taught me a lot. But one of the things I've learned, and I only know how to say this by reading what we read last week from from Jesus in John 19, right in the same place we just read. Jesus says these words in John chapter 15. He says, I will send you the advocate or the Holy Spirit or the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and he will testify all about me. And when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The reason why this is such an important thing for us to understand the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives is because what I've come to realize is that no matter what I read 
out of scripture to you. And I read everything. I preach about lying and stealing and talk about sex outside of marriage and God's covenant. I talk about pride and lust and addiction. I I talk about all these things. But the, the, the bottom line is that unless the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and convinces you that what I'm saying is true, I am powerless to convince you. I cannot convince you. My words can be persuasive, they can be clever, they can be rehearsed, they can be all kinds of things, but if the Holy Spirit does not take my words and put them in such a way that you hear it, receive it, and go, oh, that is truth, and it's undeniable, nothing changes. And in this scene that we look at between this crowd of people and, and, and Zacchaeus, Jesus talks about how he's going to leave so the Holy Spirit can come into scenarios like that that happen every single day. Where the Holy Spirit begins to move and is active and begins to challenge, change, convict, and convince people of what is right and what is wrong. Of what is sin and what is not. And it is happening all around us. There are people in this room who I've had the pleasure of being in relationship with for some of you for many years. We've been doing this thing for many years now. And I can recount some of our conversations where you told me very, very black and white things about your beliefs, about what you thought was okay and what you thought was not and what you thought was true and what you thought was false and what you thought was, man, this is a bunch of fairy tales, man. I'll never believe that stuff. And yet here you are and you believe something different now. What has happened in your life? What happened? Did you guys like just, you know, wake up someday and you're just like, oh, you know, I'm no, 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 no. What happened is the Holy Spirit filled your heart and he began to change you from the inside out. He began to renew your thoughts. He began to change the way you think. He began to open your eyes spiritually so that you could see things with a whole different way of seeing them. All of a sudden, it was no longer just temporary and natural. Spiritual things are becoming apparent to you. And all of a sudden, God is changing you from a dead person who was enslaved to sin to a living person who is free from sin. And this is all happening inside of your life. Obviously, there's a lot of things that, that are happening around us right now. And some of you in this room right now, you may feel like you can relate to this guy in this story. Maybe you're the throwaway. Maybe you're the guy or the girl that the family won't talk to anymore. You've gone too far, you've done it too many times, and it's over for you. You are the outcast, and they don't even want you to get better anymore. They've given up, hopeless, done, burned your bridge. I got a question for you. Will you let us love you? Ask yourself right now. Will you let us love you? Because what Jesus did for this man that day was something that nobody else in the crowd was willing to do. Everybody else said, no way. And he said, yes way. Will you let us love you? No matter what you've done, no matter where you are at. Come on, let's close our eyes right now. This is a religious practice. This is a spiritual exercise that we do. We close our eyes and we begin to contemplate The Bible says, examine yourself. So do that right now. Take a look inside at your heart, your soul, how you make decisions. Close your eyes and get honest. Jesus, I pray for every person in this room right now. I pray that every heart in this room right now would be convicted by your Holy Spirit. Allow them to receive your gospel, your truth. Jesus, let it be said of this house that salvation has come tonight. Lord, I pray that you would push past all of the preconceived ideas and all of the hangups that we have about ourselves. 
And let them feel your grace. Let them feel your love. Let them feel that they are welcome. And if you're here tonight and you want to respond to what I'm saying and to what Jesus is offering, I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now. Maybe you've never prayed before, but you can say this prayer. It's not a magic prayer, but it's a simple prayer from your heart. Just say, Jesus, I open my heart to you. And I say yes. I want a new life. Wash me of all of my sin. Forgive me. I surrender to you. Be the Lord of my life. And I am willing to learn love right now. Thank you, God. Jesus, I thank you that we get to pray and you hear us and you know us. I pray your blessing over every heart in this room tonight.